right, good morning. How are we doing, Colonial? Hey, buddy. All right, good seeing y'all, good seeing y'all. I had to come back and check up on you, make sure you're okay, make sure everything's on lockdown, and uh, things are good. I, 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 I always have to make sure Clint's not getting taller than me, so uh, check that box. And then I uh, also have to check, you know, Pastor Mike, Big Mike, it's summertime, so I want to make sure he's in good health, looking good, with a good tan. And uh, check that box. He's doing good there, too. But, man, great being back. Great being back, especially after a week like I've had. Um, it's always good to be back with family and friends. So uh, good to be back. Guardrails. Let's talk about it. Uh, you began a, a new series last week called Guardrails. And Guardrails, what we've come to learn about Guardrails, it's a system designed It's a system designed to keep vehicles from straying into dangerous and off-limit areas. You know guardrails. Maybe you have met a guardrail before. And uh, guardrails are on the side of the road, and what they do is they actually help keep us on the road. In fact, uh, they're designed to do maybe three things. Number one is to direct us, protect us, and minimize the damage. Minimize the damage. That's what a guardrail does on the side of the road. Now, our culture doesn't love guardrails. They don't love guardrails. Uh, You know, when you think about the culture and uh, when you think about our world today, They don't like guardrails when it comes to our life. We like to have freedom. We are very content with the painted line on the side of the road. We don't really need guardrails to keep us on the road because we think we have everything that we need and we love freedom. But guardrails are really there, just like on a highway, in our life to protect us, to direct us, and to minimize the damage. So if you were to hit a guardrail, it does minimize damage. Your car may need to go into the shop, but more than likely you won't need to go to the hospital. And so it minimizes the damage. And in our life, we need guardrails. It minimizes the damage of the decisions that we contend to make. In fact, it will keep us out of the ditch of life. It will keep us out of the ditch. We need guardrails when it comes to our finances. We need guardrails when it comes to our marriages. We need guardrails as it pertains to our business, uh, business relationships. We need guardrails when it comes to our ethics and to our, and to our morals. We need guardrails in our life, and we need guardrails in relationships. We need guardrails when it comes to our relationships. Now, as you listen today, and as we look at a small little truth in Scripture, what we're going to find is that's very applicable, but it's going to be our tendency to think, man, I wish someone else, you're, you have a name in mind, would have heard this message. I hope my student is paying attention right now. I hope my teenager is listening right now. Like that's what's going to be going through your mind. But adults, grown-ups, those of us who are mature, you know, and are in age, we need to understand that this is also applicable and relevant to us. We need guardrails when it comes to relationships as well. Question for you. Have you ever met someone that you wish you had never met? Maybe they're sitting next to you, all right? (laughs) They're like, yeah, and that person lifted their hand, they're thinking about you too. So uh, have you ever met that one person that you wish, or maybe a number of people, I wish I had never met them before? And that's because we need guardrails in relationships because at times the people that we call friends are part of our greatest regrets. The people that we call friends are part of our greatest regrets. Those that we're in proximity with, those that we do life with, those that are part of our core group of friendships or companions or acquaintances, many times our greatest regrets are connected to friendships. Friendships are very powerful, but they can also be very hazardous in our life. And what I think Scripture is going to show us today is that we need to be wise in our judgment when it comes to relationships the relationships that we're investing in, the relationships that we're giving time to, the relationships that we surround our life with, because in those relationships, they can be very powerful in a positive way. They can also be very hazardous. I remember growing up in my formative years in high school, I grew up in a very small town uh, in Northern California. And uh, my dad was a pastor there. He had the largest, uh, largest church in town. And so everybody knew my dad. I mean, I felt like I was always getting reported on, you know, um, hey, you know, your, your son did this, your son did that. And I'd always have these conversations with my dad. And, uh, you know, I, I tried to make my parents proud, just like any teenager would. But sometimes I'm not sure I always succeeded at that. I was in a very unique 
people group when I was in high school. I was, uh, I was somewhat of a jock. I played uh, uh, soccer in high school and college. But um, the people that I probably had friendships with back in these days, the late 80s, early 90s, we were skaters. This is like Tony Hawk was on the rise, you know. And so uh, we wore our bands and, you know, we, we skated. And we never did, like, got in a lot of trouble. Like, I, I wasn't a kid in high school where I went out and partied and drank and did all that stuff. We were just getting kicked out of Walmart parking lots for skating and things like that. And um, one night, we decided that we were going to do something a little bit different. There was an old warehouse outside of town uh, that was all uh, chain link f- fenced up with barbed wire on top. And it was an abandoned warehouse, been abandoned for years. And uh, there's all sorts of stories about this abandoned warehouse. Probably the same stories like your town that you grew up in, that abandoned building, all the ghost stories. And it's the same story. You find this to be true in every generation. It's the, the story of, of the girl that you know you see on the side of the road or by the warehouse that's soaking wet and she needs a ride home and you give her a ride home but when you get there and you turn around and to get out of the car she's not there but the seat is still wet you know that one uh, we all know those stories so it had a bunch of stories around it and uh, so we decided one night let's sneak into the warehouse and let's check it out let's see if the ghost stories are true so um so that's what we did we hopped over the fence and we ran into the warehouse and we were in there for a while and just kind of messing around, scaring each other, doing what kids do, I guess. And uh, I had one friend, his name was Chris Munoz, and uh, still a good friend of mine. We called him Moon. And uh, Moon was, uh, was just like us. He, he skateboarded. He was a snowboarder and um, brilliant guy, uh, absolutely brilliant. Went to UC Davis after he graduated and, you know, made a life for himself. He's, uh, but he also has spina bifida. So he was always kind of slower than everybody else. And, you know, he had a limp and... and um, and, I mean, I've never seen a guy be so resilient with a disability. And um, so we were in this warehouse, and all these, uh, these lights start shining through the window. And they're like flashlights and things. And we're like, oh, no. So we look out the windows, and it's the cops. The cops are here. They know we're here. And so we said, let's go. So we, t- we, we, we bolted out of the warehouse, and we're making a run for it. We're going to run. We're going to run, jump over the fence, get in our cars, and leave. So everyone starts running. We're running towards the fence. And everyone's getting o- over the fence. And I turn around. And my buddy Moon, who's much slower than all of us, is still like way behind. And we were going to like leave a man behind. I said, no, we can't leave a man behind. Yeah, we can. No, we can't. And so I I go back to get Moon. I I run back and I was like, come on, Moon. I'm kind of dragging him with me. And right at that time, the cops come around the corner in their patrol cars, have their lights on us and tell us to stop. And they get us against the fence. My buddies, they're all gone. I mean, great friends, right? I mean, they've left. And, uh, and so we're there, we're abandoned, we have the, we're abandoned there with the, with the police officers, and, uh, and they put us in their patrol car, and they take us into the, in the police station, and, um, and I remember this moment, because I remember when they had to call my dad, and I saw my dad walk into the lobby of the police station, I didn't, we didn't get charged or anything, I'm sure they kind of laughed about the whole incident, but when dad walked in, it must have been like the walk of shame, <laughs> you know, uh, Pastor Dennis, your, your son's in the lobby, um, so it, <laughs> I just remember that moment of going, oh, man, and it was just like friendships, you know. The only reason I did that is because all my friends were doing it, and it, it kind of reminded me. I, we were out camping earlier this week, and uh, it kind of reminded me of this T-shirt I saw uh, that I think is, is pretty good. The park ranger never thinks it is as funny as you do. <laughs> I love that because that's so true. Like, park ranger didn't think it was that funny, but I did, um, but it wasn't that funny. And that's kind of how I felt that night was that most of the things I found myself doing, my parents never thought it was quite as funny as I thought it was. But, uh, uh, and it was all based upon relationships, upon friendships. And friendships are so important. Our friends determine the direction and quality of our lives. Our friends, our friendships, they direct the direction and quality of our lives. They do. You know the old saying, my mom used to say it all the time, she would say boo-boo, because that's what she still calls me. I saw her earlier this week, and she said, boo-boo, so good to see you. And uh, she says, boo-boo, birds of feather flock together. Birds of feather flock together. Like I say that to my son, he has no idea what I'm talking about, you know, and he's like, I don't even know what that means. I'm like, well, you know, what does that mean? Uh, Birds of feather flock together. You know, there's a a doctor of neuroscience at Northwestern University who spent years, has been studying the uh, connection between relationships and decisions that we make in our life. And what he came to conclude was very interesting. 
You see, sometimes we get into relationships and into friendships, and because of the peer pressure, we end up doing things we don't want to do. We end up, uh, uh, you know, uh, we end up doing something that, that maybe we knew becomes a regret in our life. And what he actually came to find out in this study is that before we actually change our behavior or make a decision or act on a specific action, there has already been a change in our brain. Like, a, our brain has already changed. In fact, what he says is that the people that we live in proximity with, that we live in relationships with, before we ever um, make a negative action or a negative behavior because of peer pressure, our brain has already changed its thinking. Our value systems already begin to change. The way that we view the world begins to change. The things that we value begin to change. Just by being in proximity with one another, uh, neuroscience tells us that our brain waves somehow get on the same brain wave length. Like they, they get in the same place. It's very, very interesting. I don't understand it all, but I know it takes place. Just like a few minutes ago, I said a few things, and it went into your ears, and everybody laughed. Like, we got all on the same brave, uh, wavelength here. Just like that. And so what, what science is actually telling us is that the people that we surround our life with, we may not be able to see that our life is going in the ditch because we haven't made a decision or we haven't had an action or behavior that has put it in the ditch yet, but... Our brain has already synced up with them. You know this to be true. You and your wife, if you've been married for any amount of time, uh, a lengthy amount of time, uh, you can be in a social setting where someone's telling a story, sitting in a living room with friends or whatever, and someone's telling a story, and uh, you can look across the room and see your wife and know exactly what she's thinking about this story. And you know that as soon as you get in the car, you are both going to end up laughing about whatever it is, the same exact thing. Like you don't have to communicate, it's just your, your brain starts to get in sync. So we know this to be true. And so if this is true, I think what scripture would tell us as it pertains to guardrails in relationships is we have to be wise when it comes to who we surround our life with. We have to be somewhat picky of who we're going to do friendships with, who we're going to do life with. Now, sometimes when we talk about this, it seems a little judgmental. Like, oh, so we're supposed to be judgmental uh, towards people and, you know, only take friends that are worthy of our friendship or what, what have you. It's not being judgmental. Like, this isn't being judgmental. See, judgmental means that you're being placed in a position as judge. Judgmental means that you are making a conclusion about somebody because of their actions, and so you're pointing at them, and you're judging them. Relational guardrails are much different. We're not saying be judgmental. We're saying use wise judgment, good judgment. That's much different than being judgmental. Wise judgment is not about the other person. It's about me. I'm judging myself about my maturity, my spiritual maturity, my emotional maturity, my temptations, my weaknesses, my flaws, my brokenness. And I'm making a conclusion about a relationship based upon my issues, not their issues. I'm not being judgmental because, well, you know, they do this behavior, that behavior, this behavior. I'm actually using wise judgment and saying, you know, this relationship probably isn't positive for me because of who I am. It's about wise judgment. We understand this as parents. Those of you who are raising kids or have raised kids, you understand the idea of having wise judgment when it comes to friendships. In fact, your parents did. My parents did. Think all the way back when you were in high school or in your teen years and your parents were always kind of snooping around. They were paranoid about your friends. They want to make sure that whatever birds are flocking together, they need to be good birds, right? And so they're always a little paranoid about, about who you're spending time with, asking a lot of questions, and it would annoy us. And if you were a young lady and you kept a journal in your room and a diary and you would write all your things down and mom would sneak into your room while you were at school and find your diary and read it and then you would find out and be upset 
and, uh, you know, big fight break out. And then you started, like, taping the bottom of your door in case it opened. You would know if someone has broken into your room. And uh, mom said, well, then, heck, I'll just take off the door. <laughs> you know, how I many of you had parents just took off your door? Like, no, you can't lock your door. I'm just taking it off. All right. So it does happen. Right? And then they would always, we would always say, you're just being so judgmental on my friends. Like, I remember, you're just, you're just judging my friends. No, they're not judging your friends. They're trying to help you have wise judgment. And today, we're not just paranoid. We're like paranoider when it comes to our kids. But we do have a little bit of a step up in the game. We can go on social media. We can find out all about their friends. We know more about their friends than they do. By the time we meet their friends, we're like, oh, yeah, I know, I know your parents work. I know where your mom works. I know what, you know, if you were on the A honor roll. I know what you did last Friday. I know who you're in a relationship with. Like, we can find out everything. And then we have those moments where we sit down with our teenager and have those conversations about, listen, I, you know, I'm kind of concerned about your friendships. And they'll say, you're being so judgmental. No, I'm not being judgmental. I'm trying to show wise judgment in who you invest your relational bandwidth into. So we need wise judgment. 3,000 years ago, the wisest man that ever lived, King Solomon, wrote these words in Proverbs 13, verse 20. He says, walk with the wise and become wise. Walk with the wise and you will become wise. So wisdom is actually contagious, Solomon is saying. If you want to be wise and walk wisely, walk in a manner that's wise, walk, uh, have, have wisdom through life, and, and, and walk through life without your life be getting in the ditch, he says, here's what you need to do. You need to spend time with wise people, with wise people. He says that, he says that you know, spend time with the wise, and you'll become wise. But he continues in the verse, and he says this, for a companion of fools suffers harms. So, if you want to be wise, be with wise people. A companion of fool of fools will suffer harm. This word fools mainly in, in in the biblical sense means someone who lives carelessly. They're just careless with their life. Like they 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 make decisions in the moment without the idea of of, you know, uh, uh, decisions and consequences. They don't think about consequences. They just live Right there, in the moment, they make the decision. Whatever is going to be good and right for that moment, that's ever self-gratifying for that moment, they are careless in their decision-making. They're careless in the way they think of their life. They're careless in the way they live their life. They are careless to the degree that they're never thinking about the future or the direction of their life. And so Solomon is saying, the wise, if you want to be wise, hang with wise people. But if you are a companion with a fool you will suffer harm. Now let's look at the verse all together and let's, let's notice what Solomon doesn't say because I think it's telling. He says, walk with the wise and become wise. A companion of fools will suffer harm. Did you notice what he said? He could have said, walk with the wise and become wise, be a companion or walk with the fool and become a fool. He could have said that, would have made sense. But he actually doesn't say that. In fact, what he says is actually worse than that. He says, walk with the wise, become wise, be a companion with a fool, and you will suffer harm. He says, when you surround your life in relationships with foolish people, you're not just going to become a fool. He says, it's, it's, it's bigger than that. It's worse than that. You're actually going to suffer harm. You're actually going to suffer harm. When we don't have a relational guardrail in our life, then what we begin to recognize is that our life can, we can make decisions that make our life end up in the ditch. And Solomon is saying, and that's what I'm talking about. You won't just become a fool yourself. You're actually going to suffer harm. You're going to suffer harm. If you if you're a companion with a fool who lives his life carelessly, do you think he's going to take care of your life? If you're a companion with a fool who 
who is not careful with his own way that he lives, do you think he's going to be careful with the way that you live? Of course not. He's not if he's not concerned about himself, he's surely not going to be concerned about you. And so Solomon is saying, like, you know, be careful in relationships. Be careful in relationships. Be careful who you determine to invest your life in and those who invest in your life. Because if we're not careful, we may end up investing or being in proximity and in friendships with a fool. And you're not just going to become a fool, but you are actually going to suffer harm. You're actually going to suffer harm. Our friendships, they direct our lives. Our friendships have such influence on our life. And so what Solomon would say to us, I believe, today, is that he would say we need relational guardrails. What are relational guardrails? The point of a relational guardrail is to light up our conscience before we veer into the danger zone. It's to light up our conscience before we ever get into the danger zone. Like something should take place as we consider relationships and friendships around us and what we begin to, as we begin to um, kind of take inventory of our friendships and our relationships, something should light up in our conscience, a guardrail that, that keeps us on the path. It, it lights up our conscience to say, whoa, whoa, wait, time out, time out. I don't know if this is a relationship I should be investing in. I don't know if this is a friendship that I should be, you know, uh, that, 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 that I should be giving time to. I don't know if these are the people that I should be surrounding my life with. And so if I had to give a few suggestions on relational guardrails to you today, it would be some of these questions that I would throw out to you that you might want to consider as you're taking on new friendships. I don't know how you take on new friendships. I don't know if you like take resumes or not. But, um, but however you do it, these are things that I believe you should consider. And not just students and not just teenagers. All of us, when it comes to our business relationships, when it comes to relationships that we spend time with, when it comes to people that we invest in, relationships that always that go all the way back to high school. Some of your greatest regrets go back to high school and college with those friendships, and you may still have them. And what I think Solomon is saying, like, you know, it's not that you cut off the friendship, but don't let those friendships determine the direction of your life. And so what are the guardrails? What are the suggestions? Number one is this. When your friends are moving in a different direction than you want your life to go, when their, their trajectory of their life is not where you want to go. Like, your hopes, your dreams, your value systems, where, where you see your life going, if there's like some incongruency with the direction of their life <laughs> uh, and, and where you want to go, like, that should light up our conscience. When, 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 when our friendships and those people that we surround our life with, when their value systems are different, when what they want to accomplish with their life is much different. When it's not, uh, when the trajectory of their life in which it's going because of their actions or their behavior or their carelessness, when it doesn't kind of equate to godliness, when it doesn't equate to um, honoring Jesus, when it doesn't equate to being on mission with Jesus, like we should actually consider, is this a relationship I need to invest in as a close friendship? Or do I want to spend my time with wise people? Because it's not about where they're, it's not so much about where their life is leading, it's, uh, is heading. It's more about where they're leading you. It's more about where it's leading. Because they will lead you. We are, we are all susceptible. It's part of our human makeup. It's part of our weakness. Regardless of how old you are, we are all susceptible to peer pressure because we want acceptance. We want acceptance with that group of moms. We want acceptance with this group of businessmen. We want acceptance with these particular students at school. And so it, it, a lot of times these friendships get formed, and it's not about so much where their life is heading. It's about where it's leading me. And so something should pop up in our conscience when we apply or we import this small biblical truth into our life. It should, it should light up our conscience so that we recognize is this, you know, I'm looking at the pathway of their life. Is this where I want my life to end up? And you say, and you can say, well, you know, I, I'm not, not going to end up there. But you know what? 
birds of feather flock together. A, a companion of a fool will suffer much harm. It's true. They will eventually lead you down that same path. Number two, when you pretend to be someone that you are not, when you're in a friendship and you have to pretend to be someone that you're not. And this may mean you have to pretend to, um, your, your beliefs about Jesus, your beliefs about your faith, your beliefs about the values in your life, uh, uh, what you hold dear, the, the values that you have, uh, uh, your, 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 your aspirations of your life. And when you think about all those things, if you feel like you have to camouflage who you really are to be in a relationship, that is not a healthy friendship. Like, you're lying to them, and you're being dishonest with yourself. And so if you feel like to, to fit in or to, to be in this friendship, I actually have to pretend to be somebody that I'm not at home, all right, or that I'm not with other people, then that should kind of light up our conscience to say, maybe these are not the people I want to be in close proximity with that are going to help guide and direct my life. Number three, when you feel pressure to compromise. You know, this isn't just in our personal life. This comes into our business affairs. This comes into our professional life. When you believe that you have to compromise at, uh, what you believe ethically or morally just to make the deal happen, it's probably not a relationship you want to invest in. Even if the return is financial, you probably don't want to. If you feel like you have to compromise what you believe, if you feel like you have to compromise your values, if you feel like you have to compromise in any specific way in your life just to be a part of this friendship, it's probably not a healthy friendship for you. That's probably not wise being with the wise. And so we would tell this with our kids. Hey, don't compromise your standards. Don't compromise who you are. But yet we as parents sometimes do this as well. Sometimes we compromise. Number four. When you say to yourself, I'll go, but I won't participate. <laughs> like, we used this excuse when we were teenagers. Well, mom, I'm going, but I'm not going to do that stuff. You know me. Like, how many times do we say that when we were 15, 16, 17 years old, prior to the time when which our front lobal system in our brain wasn't fully developed, so we couldn't make accurate you know, decisions, but now we have fully developed global systems as adults, uh, at least by the time you're 25, 26 years old. So we should be able to know cause and effect. We should be able to make wise decisions. And so this idea of like, hey, honey, I'm going to go out with the guys. Don't worry. We're going to, but I'm not going to participate. Like you are using an adolescent reason of why you're going to go hang out with this particular group of friends, thinking that it's not going to do you any harm. It's ridiculous. I was speaking to a man just this past week who had a 17-year-old daughter. He is telling me about a, uh, a conversation they had that she was telling him that on Friday night, her and her friends were going to go to this party. And he's trying to be um, the dad, uh, I think, that's not trying to put too many guardrails down, wants her to, to learn to make her own decisions, and, and, uh, you know, but also direct and, and guide. And, and so he sat her down. He said, okay. He said, listen, if that's what you guys want to do, if you and your friend want to go to this party, he said, let's just think this through together. So you're going to go to this party, and you know there's going to be underage drinking there. Yeah, Dad, but we're not going to do that. I'm going to go, but we're not going to participate. He said, okay, well, let, let's just think it all the way through. There's going to be underage drinking there. At some point, the party's going to get loud. Someone's going to call the cops. When the cops show up, it doesn't matter if you've had a drink or not. If they found alcohol, you're going to be cited for underage drinking. Is that something that you want on your record? Do you want a citation or a ticket of underage drinking even though you weren't participating? Is that what you want? And she said, well, Dad, we're going to do it anyways. Interestingly enough, on the way to the party, this young lady was telling her friend about the conversation she had with her dad. She calls her dad and says, Dad, we're not going to go to the party. We're just going to come home, rent a movie, and uh, eat popcorn and just hang out at home. And they ended up not going. A pretty wise young lady, right? Why can't we as adults make those same type of decisions? Like recognizing that, well, I'm going to go, but I'm not really going to participate in their behavior or in their actions. Like it, it just doesn't work. 
at some point, you're going to, at some point, because there's no guardrail, you're going to make that decision. You're going to, you're going to make a decision. It's going to be a regret and your life is going to end up in the ditch. And so that should light up our conscience. And then number five, when you hope the people that you care about don't know your whereabouts. If you hope that the people that, actually, that you actually care about don't know your whereabouts, that they don't know where you are, if you go through that thought of like, I'm hanging out, I'm, I'm with this group of friends, we're going here, I hope no one knows. Like, if that comes across the radar, hello, <laughs> probably not a wise decision. You're probably not being influenced very well. And so th this should light up our conscience. Bring us back to Proverbs 13, 20. Be with the wise and you'll be wise. Be a companion of a fool, you're going to suffer harm. The, 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 this should kind of light us up. Like, husbands, if you are hanging out with your buddies after the softball game, and you go somewhere, and you think to yourself, I hope my wife doesn't find out that I'm here, guess what? Those aren't friends that care about your life. They only care about that moment for themselves. Students, if you find yourself in a position, and you think to yourself, I hope my parents don't know I'm here, guess what? You have been led by your friends. They have determined the direction of your life and you've put your place in a place of you, you've put yourself in a place that 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 could end up really bad friendships are so powerful but yet they're also very hazardous when we don't have guardrails when we don't have relational guardrails the reality is god he desires us to be in community he desires us to be in friendships, powerful friendships. He knows the power of friendships and relationships in our life. God designed us this way. He designed us to be connectors with other people. That's a part of who we are. He, he, he actually wants us to do that. He wants us to be in friendships. He wants us to be in relationships. But what he wants us to be in are relationships that are life-giving relationships. He wants us to be in relationships that, that is surrounded with people that are on a journey of life that is full of wisdom. Like, like we're all on this journey, but they're wise people. That their, 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 their vision of their future and their dreams and their aspirations of what they hope to become in the future, that they match up with yours. That their value systems are like yours. That, that what they believe about their faith is like yours. God desires us to be in life-giving relationships, life-giving, Christ-centered relationships. Here at Colonial Church, we, we would say that we also desire that. We want you to invest in relationships. We want you to invest in life-giving relationships. You know, uh, here, here at Colonial, we, we, we have ways for you to connect in these type of relationships. We, we used to call them circles. Now I think we're just small groups, but you know, whatever. Circle, small group, triangle, square, whatever. Doesn't matter. Get in relationships with others that have the same passion that you have, that have the same values that you have, that honor the same things that you honor. Because be with the wise and you'll become wise. Now, the reality is, when you get a bunch of people in relationship together, guess what? Everybody is screwed up. You're messed up, I'm messed up. We're all messed up people, all of us, right? But there's a difference between, between investing in broken people like you might find in a small group that is on a journey to seeing God redeem their greatest regrets, to see the gospel transform their lives, allowing the Holy Spirit to change their life. You're not going to get away from broken and screwed up people because you can't get away from yourself, right? We're not going to get away from it. But you can journey through life in life-giving relationships that may be just as broken as yours, but you're, the direction in which you're heading, the, the direction in which you're pursuing, it's the same. It's, it's honoring Christ. It's, it's life-giving. It's Christ-centered. 
So this small little truth that Solomon gives us in Proverbs 13, 20, you may want to memorize it this week. Remind your students, remind yourself, remind your parents, whoever. Remind yourself that, you know what? Be with the wise and I'll become wise. If I'm a companion of fool, I will suffer harm. I will suffer harm. This is an ageless truth that somehow we continually try to test, even though it's been proven. That, that we need to be people who are investing, the people that we surround our lives with. Like, we need guardrails. And if any of those five suggestions make our conscience light up, we need to reconsider maybe, you know, making some layoffs on our friendships. Like, hey, sorry, you didn't cut it. Not in a judgmental way, because it's not about being judgmental about their actions or their behavior. It's about you having wise judgment for yourself. Be it the wise, you'll become wise. Be it the fool, you'll suffer harm. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today. Thanks for our time together. Thanks for this simple truth that we find from Solomon here in Proverbs chapter 13. And Lord, I pray that we can apply this to our own life. I pray that uh, even, uh, even us as grown adults, that, that, this, that this becomes a, a grid. It, it becomes a guardrail in our life. It's where we, um, where when we do an assessment of the relationships, where, we're, where I'm spending my time, where I'm making my relational deposits, that, uh, that I'll recognize that, that God wants me to make relational deposits deposits. He wants me to be in life-giving relationships. And friendships can be so powerful, but they can also be so hazardous. May we make wise decisions. May we demonstrate wise judgment and invest our lives in others and lead them in the path of righteousness. Lead them in the path of godliness. May that be the type of people we surround ourselves with. And in your name, amen.